not here, he's in New York, but uh, yeah, he's a great writer. I'll get into it real quick how I met Scott. I was just a fan of Scott's writing. He had written uh, on The Fighter, he had written Eight Mile. We'd become friends, we'd been emailing each other. He once sent me a script he wanted me to do, a, a show for HBO that I couldn't do because I was working on something else. And But we had just become friends over email and when I came up with this idea, um, I just emailed him and said, hey, I have this really weird idea. I'd love to write it with you. And we started writing together, it was really, so we had never written before together, but it was a it was a great partnership. And what was the idea at that point? What did you tell him about it? Well, the idea was, um, you know, to, to 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 do something really meaningful in the comic book space. Not to say that other stuff is not meaningful, but something where we can make a movie that really addresses uh, the times that's going on. Um, something that really reflected these modern times was a little bit of the pitch. Uh, uh, I had a little bit of it worked out, the, the Arthur of it all, and, and of course it being a Joker origin story. Um, and we just started meeting. I don't know how people in here write, but we met and just talked for a few months before we even started writing. And then we started writing an outline, which which took takes us a long, we were pretty slow. And um, <laughs> we wrote an outline and we just started uh, really page one. I've had writing partners before, I don't know how you guys do it with writing partners, but with me we really sat in a room together and wrote a lot. And then other times I'd be like, you know what, I'll take those next three scenes from the outline, you take the three after, and then we switch pages and stuff like that. Uh, were you doing this mainly uh, just through email or would you? No, we were doing it in New York. Uh, he lives in New York. I, I go back and forth, so I, was, I stayed in New York for a long time. We did 95% of it in New York. This might be something you've answered a lot over the months, but um, what was the origin of that idea? When did it come to you? How did Joker become a part of it? Because I think this film could live independently of the Joker if you <laughs> yeah. wanted it to. Yeah, um, but it might not have done a billion dollars. I know. I know. <laughs> well, that was really the origin. The origin of the idea was, um, I had made a movie previously called War Dogs with jo Miles Teller and Jonah Hill. And we, thank you. And what I realized, I was literally standing outside the premiere of War Dogs. And you know, when you have a movie coming out, you kind of know what it's gonna do or how people are gonna respond to it. And it didn't feel like the movie, while it was gonna do fine and people were writing fine about it, it didn't feel like it was gonna set the world on fire. I was standing outside of the premiere on Hollywood Boulevard because um, I never watch the movies with an audience at a premiere. It's very nerve-wracking and all that. And I was staring at a billboard for a superhero film, and I was thinking, you know, this is just where the movie business is headed, and not so much superhero movies, but just the idea with all the amazing content on Netflix and HBO and all the million Hulu services, to get people to go to a theater, you really have to do something that cuts through the fog. And, and War Dogs was sort of a movie that felt not of its time in that way. It didn't feel like a fog cutter. And I'm, cause you're up against these superhero movies. And I was just thinking that's just where the business is headed. And the movies I grew up on, I wonder if those movies could get made nowadays because you know, I wonder if those would cut through the fog. And I thought, well, they would if you made it about one of those guys. And that was really the origin of the idea, meaning one of those superheroes on the billboard. Um, and then I just thought, oh, it'd be cool to do a villain origin story in the vein of the films that I kind of worshipped and grew up on. And that was the origin, origin of the idea. And what was it from the times now that that really uh, galvanized that idea? Were you thinking about writing about people who are cast aside or people who feel isolated, well, angry? What was It wasn't as much that. It was more just the kind of lack of empathy that I was feeling in, in the world and in the, the sort of discourse. So we wanted to do something that addressed that. You know, I, to put it simply, I say, you know, when Barack Obama was president, I wrote and directed three Hangover movies. <laughs> <laughs> then everything changed. <laughs> and we come up with this. <laughs> so it's very much a reflection of the times. <laughs> I think, you know, movies are so often, as writers, I think, at least for me, so, so often a mirror for what's going on. So, so really it wasn't specifically the, the original idea about mental illness or loneliness or all those things. It was really about the lack of empathy in the world and what does that create.
Um, then on top of that, we added childhood trauma, lack of love in Arthur's life, and sort of you get the villain you deserve was kind of the, the one-liner that Scott and I would kind of bounce back and forth. Well, and I thought that was one of the most powerful things about this movie is like for three quarters of it, I felt like I cared a lot about Arthur and I was, I, I felt sad when things would go badly for him. And then there's a turn where you are afraid of him. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I, I wondered if you could talk about taking an audience on that journey and, and, and how far you could take them uh, before you knew you had to sort of make them cut ties with that character. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. I don't know that I have the, the exact answer because I think for some people it's different when they make that turn on Arthur. And I've spoken to some people that never do. <laughs> and that's okay too. <laughs> but it is, um, you know, it's a testament to, I think, Joaquin's performance where he really draws you in and you feel so much for him. I mean, we wrote the movie. When I pitched the movie to Warner Brothers, it was, imagine Joaquin Phoenix and da 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 da. So Joaquin was in our mind from, from minute one. And not just because he's such a fantastic actor, but also because there is something about him <clears throat> that I think makes you want to take care of him and feel for him. So the, the trick of the movie in a way is that, that it's such a slow burn and that you don't really realize this kind of unraveling. I mean, you realize it, but there isn't really one moment, I think, where he becomes Joker. It, it's a kind of really slow evolution or, or de-evolution or whatever. Um, and uh, yeah, so... For me, it was when he goes into the neighbor's apartment, and mm -hmm. we never really find out what he does or doesn't do. Mm -hmm. why, right. Why did you choose to keep that mysterious? Well, it's funny. To us, it was clear he didn't kill her. We never really even meant it to be misleading. It became a thing when the movie came out. Um, and to us, it was really clear that Arthur really only did things to people who, in his mind, fucked him over. And, and she had, you know, she was a fantasy, a delusion of his. He realized that at that moment. We cut to him laughing in his apartment, you know, realizing, you know, that the jig is up and I really am crazy or what, you know, like I really, these delusions are real. And um, so it was not so much like, ooh, let's keep him guessing, uh, honestly, but, but now I realize we could ask that a lot that maybe we should have resolved it. <laughs> well, I thought it worked too because... Well, it's, it's funny because in the screenplay we did have a scene where she was watching Murray Franklin and just reacting to her neighbor who had been in her apartment being, you know, her being horrified. But we realized when we were editing, it was really the whole movie is Arthur's point of view. And that was the one time we were cutting to a scene that didn't involve him, her apartment. Yeah, he's on TV, but that has nothing to do with him in a way. So it kind of broke the, the, that one point of view through the movie. So we took it out, not realizing that then people might think she's dead, but she's not. She's doing fine. There we go. We got an answer. She's got a new job. She's doing great. She's doing great. Great guy. Uh, how much did the character evolve and change from uh, the script you and Scott were preparing once Joaquin got involved? I know, I know recruiting Joaquin to take the part was a long process in and of itself for you. So how, how did your discussions with him end up shaping Arthur? I mean, with him, it was more about always talking about specificity. It wasn't so much broad strokes of script screenwriting and like, oh, this scene or that scene. It was always just drilling down and getting more and more specific with the character that he was going to inhabit. There were things he was worried about, like the laugh, which is a really hard thing to do if you're an actor. I, if anybody just like, okay, in this you're going to be laughing out of the blue. He struggled with that for a while. He struggled with being in a quote unquote comic book movie, even though it really isn't, it's still called Joker, it's still, DC is still a label on it, you know. He just had never seen himself doing one of those movies. So a lot of that- Resisted doing them. He resisted, yeah, he's turned them down, stuff. he's, you know. And so a lot of it was getting over those humps and, but mostly it was, it was constantly with Joaquin always wanting to dig deeper, but it wasn't so much about writing, it was just about what does this mean, where is he at here? And just when I thought we would have him, okay, he's in, he's in, he'd go, oh, what are you doing tomorrow? You want to come back? And I'd go, okay. Cause I mean, this went on for like three or four months at his house, three or four hours a day. And uh, I jokingly say, Joaquin is the tunnel at the end of the light. He, could, <laughs> he just <laughs> wants to keep going. But it was an amazing process and it really made for a great shorthand when we ended up shooting the film. Was that, uh Difficult for you because the laugh is what the one specific like 
clinical ailment that Arthur has that's a real thing. Otherwise, you kept it somewhat nebulous what he's actually afflicted with. I think, well, you tell us, what's the reason for keeping it a little bit vague? You could have ascribed a lot of different It was really for him. It was for him. If we had said, oh, he's, I'm making it up bipolar, he's schizophrenic, I didn't want him to dig too deep into that stuff and play that. We just wanted it to be, you know, damaged. He's damaged. He's left-footed with the world, which isn't at all part of his mental illness, but he's somebody who would be out of step even without mental illness, and we just didn't want him to get too deep into one thing. So Scott and I, while we did our own research on, on you know, the sort of um, what, what, what a specific thing looks like, we didn't want to put it in the script, and we kind of kept it fairly vague. I thought... Uh, throughout the film that there were so many moments where I was rooting for somebody to respond to him with kindness. I think that's why the, the relationship with the neighbors, that's such a, a gut punch when you find it, it didn't happen. Uh, the woman on the bus, yeah, you, you know, because she's just mean to him, he's trying to make her kid laugh, even uh, even Thomas Wayne. Yeah. If he had just I know. Well, accepted you know, him a little bit, there would have been, a, I think that would have course corrected. Well, the movie's about the things what we're talking about, and they say childhood trauma and lack of love and, and sort of the lack of empathy in the world. It's also about the power of kindness. And it sounds crazy to say that about Joker movie. I'm not talking about the Mr. Roger movies movie, but it is sort of similar in that way. It's, it's, it is about if somebody had just been like, hey, you're doing okay, <laughs> it might, you know, it could be different. And, and I do think what I've learned even showing the movie around the world is I've had people come up to me at Q and A's like this, or stand up and they're asking a question and say, you know, I just, my sister suffers from schizophrenia. It's always been such a burden on me. I've always I've always thought about it through my lens, and I watch this and I just realize I need to treat her differently. I need to be more patient, or I need to be. And I, I think that's kind of a, a really wonderful side effect of the movie. I, I know it does. It does sound insane to compare to Mr. Rogers, but if Mr. Rogers had met Arthur Fleck back in the eighties, <laughs> yeah. Like the they had dough. similar sweaters now they think about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I think uh, we're going to open it up to the audience for a few questions, so, so keep some of those in mind. But I, I wonder if, uh, before we got to that, the last thing I want to ask you is about the, uh, the, uh, the way the story may have evolved or changed throughout the writing process. Um, at the end, there's a, I know you said you wanted the neighbor thing to be a little more clearly understood than than perhaps a, a mystery, but there's also debate about whether any of what we see after the taxi rams into the cop car, like is that all in Arthur's head? Do you like what an audience is guessing or interpreting a little bit? I mean, I do think it's intentionally ambiguous. I think it's, um, you know, there is nothing in there unintentional. And even the Sophie thing, we, it's not that we didn't really think of it, I just didn't know it upset people as much as it did <laughs> alarm. <laughs> alarm them. But, but. Yeah, I mean, I think I think part of doing an origin story about Joker, about an unreliable narrator, and also Joker, it's almost like a double unreliable narrator, is to sort of um, lean into the ambiguity. So we had we had fun with that and sort of backwards engineering that in the writing process and in making it. All right, let's take a few uh, questions from the audience. Um, I think I'll start over here with this woman in in Joker purple. <laughs> Great. Um, um, thank you so much. That was beautiful. Um, I was wondering at the end, uh, why did you choose to have uh, one of the other people shoot the lane? Um, because he was he was busy. <laughs> By the way, could everybody hear the question? Oh, the yeah. she asked why at the end did uh, did Todd choose to have some other like a Joker acolyte uh, shoot the Waynes in the alleyway? You know, in the comic books, which we did. We borrow a little from here and there from different comic books in the or in the comic books. Joker never killed the Waynes. Only in Tim Burton's movie is is Joker responsible for ki killing Waynes. Even in uh, Chris Nolan's films and in Zack Snyder, it's never actually Joker. It's always a, a guy. I forget his name. Joe. It has a weird name in the comics, but um, nothing to do with Joker. So what we did was it was inspired by Joker, but it didn't make sense for. Again, him to go and, and kill them. It wasn't about that, but it was about they, they kind of died because of him. Right down to the Zorro movie. Is right down to the Zorro, the Zorro yeah. In the, 
comics, they were seeing Zorro. In the comics, they were originally seeing Zorro, the original Zorro. For us, our movie takes place in 1981. So that year, Zorro the Gay Blade was coming out. It was sort of a Zorro parody movie, but it, parody movie, but it made sense. Yeah, right here in the blue sweat, sweatshirt. So he's asking about the photo, Arthur turns it over, it says, love your smile, TW, and then he kind of crumples it up like whatever. Um, yeah, that's another thing, a bit, a little bit ambiguity, could be anything, you know, but we are leaning into the idea that maybe possibly he is Batman, Bruce Wayne's half-brother, and he is the son, I and mean, we like that theory, but it wasn't, we never really answer it concre concretely. She could have written it, she's a little crazy, you know, we don't know. Let's take a question in the way, way back. Yeah, you. Um, thanks for being here. Uh, first, I just to Wait for the mic, he's oh, yeah. running. By the way, real quick, how many people today, this is the first time seeing, I'm just curious, wow, oh wow, great. Thank you for coming. Um, this is my second time, and I just want to quickly say I love the the due date shout out to the actor <laughs> Ethan Chase. Yes, um, thank you. That might be my favorite film of yours. Um, I agree, it's mine. Is it really? <laughs> love that. Um, directed the shit out of it. Thank anyway, um, <laughs> this one's great. But I just I wanted that your other films looks like you know you shot anamorphic yeah. on film. Uh, this one's one eight five, and it was from what I can tell, it was shot digitally. Can you talk a little bit about the decision to do that? Did it have anything to do with the, the height of the city? It did. It had more to do with the... He's asking about aspect ratio. This will be a yeah. quick technical answer. This movie was shot 185. Every other movie I've ever shot is 235, 240, whatever we call it, and uh, wider screen. And it's also... It's mainly because every movie I've ever done has been about a group of people, group of guys. Dude, it's about Zach you know, and Robert Downey. Uh, when you're framing for one person and you're framing close-ups, it just didn't feel as right to me to be anamorphic or widescreen. So we went with the 1A5, and also because Gotham is tall and we wanted to feel like everything is sort of bearing down on him. So very simple answer for that, but thank you. Yeah, back here on the uh, on my right hand, high hand side in the way back. Um, here he comes. <laughs> <laughs> He's getting his steps in. Thank you. Um, also my voice, so it's perfect. <laughs> what was your most, um, the scene that you love writing the most, the one that it was difficult when you were back and forth, and now that you see it on the film, how, from your concept, how it's different, or how do you end up loving it? Um, I don't know that it, there's one that um, is a favorite. I, I think one of the one of my favorite scenes to write because sometimes you have as writers you have these kind of bursts of inspiration, and I remember writing the scene where Randall and the little guy come to his apartment and then he kills you know Randall, and the whole thing with the door and like every as soon as he locked the door, <laughs> I was scared for the little guy. That was a really fun scene to write and shoot because it really goes from. It, it, the scene tonally kind of goes in four different directions in one scene, and, and it, there's a hard scene to shoot because of that. You know, it's, it starts out with tension, it moves to sort of abject horror, and then comedy a little bit with the guy, and then back to feeling for it. It's like one of these scenes that is tonally all over the place. Really? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I would say probably that scene we had, we had a good time with, and um, yeah. Well, you know, it's a great, it's a great, real quick, it's also the benefit of having a writing partner because I remember I wrote that scene, showed it to Scott, he, he loved it, but he goes, I don't know about the ending, ending, not the thing that's in the movie, because it, it went on. So Arthur then lets the little guy out of the door, he goes, he runs, and he kind of wipes the blood off himself, and then all of a sudden there's a knock on the door and it's Gary again, and he can't reach the elevator button. <laughs> <laughs> And Scott's like, you know, it's like you had me, and then like you went too far. <laughs> I don't think but he would have come back to Arthur. That, that that's the that's the hangover in me. Like that's just like. That's just weird, man. <laughs> Let's take a question here. Uh, 
Uh, Todd, can you, oh, I'm sorry, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Todd, can you talk a little bit about the process to kind of onboard the studio in DC with this film and really protecting the vision for it? You know, it was, it was, it was really difficult in the beginning because, um, not because of gun violence or the things we think, just really tone, which is really what we do as writers, is tone. And it really was such an out there tone for, for, the, for the world of comic book movies that they had been even making. Um, and they had kind of been moving away a little bit from the darker stuff, and then we come in with this. So it, it took a while to convince them to get them on board, and a lot of it had to do, quite frankly, with just it being a really small budget, relatively speaking, to superhero movies. We, we, we ended up shooting over $60 million, which is a lot of money, but at Warner's, it's like an independent film, at least at, at, you know, at their, in their comic book world it is. So by keeping it really low budget, it really enabled us to kind of fly under the radar and also do what we wanted to do. They were amazing once they said yes. Getting the yes, like we all know with any of this stuff, is the hard part. I always feel like what writers, directors, what we really do is get the ball from the five yard line in. Like anyone can get the ball to the five yard line. It's those last 15 feet that is just makes the whole difference. Well, when did it begin? What year was it? like? When we started writing it in um, about October 2016. Um, and we wrote it for that year and a half, basically, and then we shot it. You want to do like two more? Yeah, a couple more, I'm fine. All right, cool. Uh, let's see here. Yes. Yes, you uh, in the front. Hello. Um, this is my fourth time saying it, Todd. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> The turning point were the social workers. I was concerned both of them seemed so dismissive. And I was wondering what the first social worker, she, I thought she could have saved him, giving him his medication. She didn't offer any resources or options. So can you tell me? A but what do you mean the first? You mean the social worker is the same social worker in both scenes? Oh, yeah. Right, it's the same, it's Sharon Washington, same actress. But the woman at the end, and in the, in the white room, that's a different woman. Yes. Right. That's what she meant. But, is there anything you're talking about? you the woman at the very end? And the first one. Oh, the yeah. Um, I mean, to us, the movies, to me, the system is broken, and it's been broken for a long time, and we wanted to reflect that in the treatment that Arthur's able to get, which is probably court-ordered treatment, where he goes in once every two weeks and basically has to check in and they go through a checklist of questions. So it's intentionally that. It's that she's got a pile of people to see and it's just a medication, do it, ask you five questions and get them out. But it was very much to us a way of illustrating that the system is broken. She seemed like somebody who cared but really only had so much oh, So give. much power. And then in her second scene when she's like, you know, they don't give a shit about you. Quite frankly, they don't give a shit about me either. It's just, yeah. you know, and that was a thing in the 80s, you know, with Reagan cutting those programs, those social services programs. And again, while the, you know, movie takes place in 81, we also see it as a movie that is about now, but that still exists. But some of that, the garbage strike, the cutting of social services was something that really was going on back then. We were seeing the effects of that in our own city, the yeah. uh, homeless epidemic, where right. these are people that probably should be in some sort of treatment or getting right. care, and there is none for right. them, so we cast them out. Yep. Um, all right. All right, we got This it. guy said he saw it eight times. Okay. So he... He must... deserved the last question. So I don't think he's going to be okay unless he gets that. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yes. The first time I saw it before noon. Eighth time. <laughs> So when I debate with people why it's the obvious winner for the Best Picture Oscar, oh, I say, you know, it could be summed down to, right, right? It could be summed down to one line in the film that it represents when he says, I never really knew if I existed or not. And that's what this film, that's why I think it transcends a lot of people's genre, bias, whatever the case. And I was wondering if there's there any line in the film that you think is, I think sums the it up. Like, most important line that sums up the movie is when he says, you know, the, the, the worst part about having a mental illness is people expect you to behave as if you don't. Yeah. And I think that's the thing that's really connected with people around the world that do suffer. Because it's not like, you, you know, if you have a broken arm, people hold the door open for you. We know you, okay, you need help. You're in a wheelchair, you need help. Mental illness, you're broken, but it's invisible. And people just expect you not to 
habit, basically. You know, like you look fine. Feel uncomfortable too, and they don't know how to react. And yeah, they don't know necessarily what's going on with you. Yeah. So if I had to boil it down to one line, I, I think that, and I think the line you're pointing out, which is about you know, I used to not even believe that I existed, but I do, and people are starting to notice that line's important too, and and that line's just about that that sort of. Um, intense loneliness that I think Arthur feels throughout the movie, so lonely that he just actually feels invisible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel like there are two kinds of people, basically. Like, everybody endures their share of abuse and heartache, but, like, if you... Some people take that and they magnify it and dump it on others and become worse people and create the same sort of problems that they suffered, and other people say, like, I'm gonna stop this and make sure that it never happens to somebody else. And I feel like if anybody had shown him kindness, that he might have had something to go on, and instead, it was just this pushback against the world that he right. resorted to. What do you think about that? I mean, I, I don't know if it's as simple as just two types, yeah. and if, but but I do, yeah. I mean, I definitely agree that you know he also does have a mental illness. Yeah. It's not just if you pat him on the back, but he just needed the right treatment and care, yeah. and um, you know he, he didn't get it. But let's do one more question. Thirty-three times. I. Uh, but you know, I I believe her because she she saw it last time I saw you. You had seen it 20, 23 times. So I talked to a security guard at Warner Brothers who had seen it twenty-six times, but in a row, and he was not the same. <laughs> but that's different. He has to do it for a yeah, job. He was just sort but of shaking. She, I, I met her before. She was at a screening at the Arrow in Santa Monica, right. and uh, she had seen it twenty-three times at that point. And your husband was with you, wasn't it? No. Oh. So, just a friend. Oh, just a friend. Uh -oh. <laughs> but but he, he, he sort of confirmed it is all I meant. <laughs> all right. Uh, oh, so 33 times. You. Yes. Um, I'm pretty stable, don't worry. <laughs> um, it's similar to the question I asked before, but uh, I read that script that was online. Uh-huh. Is that the I don't know what script's online. There was a script that leaked on April draft, and oh. if I put it into context, the script that leaked was an April draft, we shot the movie with a September draft. I think everybody in this room that are writers know there's probably 14 drafts in between that. Mm -hmm. So it was a little disappointing that maybe what you read is the April draft. Perhaps. Right. So I just noticed the vast difference between that Arthur and yes. the one we met. Yeah. Not as likable as this one. And I was wondering if that was a conscious decision or if that's just what happened. Again, I think that probably happened in the in the 12 drafts in between April and September, and some of it probably talking to Joaquin, some of it probably just Joaquin inhabiting the role makes it more likable. So if I may ask, the um, issue with the medication, um, the f second time I watched it, it looked to me like he was medicating his mother. Mm -hmm. And the, dra the script that I read actually spelled that out. Yeah, in the, in the early, early drafts, he was sharing his medication with his okay. mother more to just keep her in bed and out of his hair. That's true, but we took that out because we didn't, it just didn't feel like we needed it. Took it out of the script. Right, it yeah. still showed a little bit in the movie. Yeah. I was pretty suspicious about that, but right. I'm, I'm glad you took it out. <laughs> uh, 33 times, you catch everything. Did you catch any like, no, but did you catch any real mistakes? I'm curious. Cause, uh, oh, what? What's the mistake? Can we know? Yeah, I'm just curious. No, just uh, the, the, the VCR in 1981, I think it was pretty hard for people to see this. Yeah, good point. She said the VCR, it's 1981. They don't seem like the type of people that afford a VCR in 1981. Yeah. Maybe they won it in a contest. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they won it in a radio contest, yeah. <laughs> All right, I think... It, uh, yeah, that's good. I mean, I, 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 could, I, I could stay. I just don't know how long we have the theater board. So. Thank you. You've been a really oh. great audience. Wonderful questions. Thank you to co-writer, producer, and director of Todd Phillips.